Oh my goodness. So, uh, yeah, I watched the new Indiana Jones movie this morning. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Old fuck Indiana on one final adventure. One final adventure. So I had no expectations really going into this movie. Um, James Mangold is like a very good director. He's like a very solid director, I guess. He's kind of he's workman. He's workmanlike, you know. He kind of reminds me a little bit of like uh, John Borman, in the way that he's just like understands the fundamentals of making a movie and telling a story. And more often than not, he's successful. So when he got hired for it, I was like, oh, you know, that actually seems like a pretty good choice. Like if you're going to kind of just do like a Spielberg ripoff or knockoff type tone, which I imagine is what you're gonna do, why wouldn't you do that? He seemed like a good hire. Um, I, I thought Harrison Ford was way too fucking old. I didn't see the point. I mean, they should never have done Kingdom of Crystal Skull. Um, there's a great clip online. Uh, it's from the making of Kingdom of Crystal Skull where Steven Spielberg basically just admits that he was browbeat by, <laughs> by George Lucas into directing uh, Crystal Skull. And like Harrison Ford is like begging him. He's like, don't leave me with George. Don't leave me with that fuck. And anyway, it was very, it's very entertaining. And um, yeah, so I watched it this morning. I'm, I've heard all the stuff, all the nerds. All the YouTube nerds losing their fucking minds about it. I've heard all about it. Oh, it's a disgrace. It's the, this is just another example of the woke machine doing what the woke machine does. And, uh, and I would say they're kind of like partially right, but not, not in totality. Um, the, the worst part about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is how uh, mediocre it is. It's a very mediocre movie. It's a very flat movie. It's, it's like not paced very well. It feels like um, something made by a committee, like this attempt to try to please everybody and will please no one. That's really, at the end of the day, that's kind of what it is. It just feels like a weird hodgepodge of ideas and nothing ever really coalesces or comes together by the time the credits roll. Um, one good thing though, one good thing I will say about it is uh, Harrison Ford himself. Harrison Ford is actually very good in this movie, which has kind of made the whole the whole endeavor a shame. Uh, he really locked into it. It brings a lot of weight, a lot of pathos to the character uh, that I wasn't really expecting. There's actually even one scene where uh, it's revealed what happens to his son, Mutt. So spoiler alert, they unceremoniously, they kill Mutt. Shia LaBeouf. They keep, they kill the beef. They kill them off screen. He uh, he joined, he signed up for the military, and went to Vietnam to piss off his dad, and ends up getting killed in action. And uh, he's, you know, he has like this kind of this like quiet little soft monologue that was very affecting about um, what he would tell his son if he could go back in time and tell him not to join the military. Um, and it's it was actually it was really nice. It was a really nice little moment. It was very human. It's probably the best performance Ford has given in like, shit, I don't know, 20 years? I mean, he hasn't really done anything substantial performance-wise since the fucking 90s. I mean, and then that's like in the mid-90s. Even by the late 90s, he was already done. I mean, by the time we get to the 2000s, he's like making a Hollywood homicide with Josh Hartnett. He's fucking, it's over. <laughs> it's over, bro, to quote our, uh, our good friend DVDR. It's over, bro. Ford gave up. He gave up. He saw the writing on the wall. His parents wouldn't leave him alone either. Uh, yeah. Um, and the one thing that everybody has been saying, like even the fucking, the, uh, the YouTube nerds, the YouTube nerds, the geeks and gamers, the Gary's from Nerdrotics, the quarter black guys, uh, they all have been saying that the opening, so there's like an, there's basically a prologue that kind of sets the MacGuffin up and sets everything in motion. That happens, you know, 1939 or something like that, I think. Or, or no, is it 1939? I don't know, I can't remember exactly, the exact date. There are Nazis about, okay? They have found th this thing, because you know, Nazis, occultism, all that good stuff. Kind of trying to bring it full circle to Raiders a little bit, make it there, there be a connection, because the best indie movies are the ones with the Nazis in it. You know, Raiders and The Last Crusade. So, uh, and it's the D.H. Harrison Ford thing. And it's kind of a big sequence. It's like 22 minutes long. It's a big uh, set piece. 
And um, I didn't think it was very good. Uh, they all said, oh, I wish they just made a whole movie like this, you know, whatever. It would have been better than what we got. And I totally disagree. It is a, it's like a monstrosity. It's like a CGI fucking nightmare. It's, uh, the, the, the whole de-aging thing, it has this uncanny valley effect that is fucking weird. And to add insult to injury, um, you're looking at, like, this young, dead-eyed doll face of Harrison Ford. And it's his old man voice. Because he's doing the, the voice for it. And it's clearly all adr And it makes it sound even weirder because it just sticks out of the... They didn't, like, mix it well. So it mixed in with the environment. There's even, like, one moment where him and uh, Toby Jones are in the water. They, like, jump off something. They end up in a lake or whatever. And Toby Jones is, like, he's dealing with water. You can hear his voice and the choking from trying to swim and stuff like that. And then there's just Harrison Ford. <laughs> Are you okay? Without any, like, with no effect that he's in water. So it kind of just makes the whole thing weird. And also, it just looked like it's all cartoonish. It's all done on green screens and, and shit like that. And it kind of misses the magic of the Indiana Jones set pieces. The magic being the practical, their practical nature. Same thing happened in Kingdom of Crystal Skull. You know, there was a lot of that movie uh, where some of the big chase scenes, you know, obviously the, the famous swinging on the vines of the monkey scene, that they're all CGI. And they're awful because of that. Uh, they just look bad. This, it, you know, it's, it's years and years later and that is still the case. It still does not look good. And uh, yeah, it was bad. It was weird too, because they have this, like the, it kind of culminates with them being on top of a speeding train and he's like fighting some Nazi guy and uh, there's barely any wind up there. You see the train, they're on a train, tons of fog and smoke everywhere so they didn't have to render the environment. And, uh, and there's no like wind. Like Toby Jones's hair is like barely moving. Their clothes are not like fluttering. You know what's like a really good on top of the train fight sequence? Another, the sequel of which is coming out this summer is Mission Impossible 1, right? You know, obviously a lot of that done on a set, whatever, but at least, at least they took the time to make it look like they were on top of a fucking train by having a giant wind machine there, okay? They did that small, that small little detail kind of makes all the difference in the world. I know that sounds nitpicky, but it really like stuck out like a sore thumb. I was like, they're on top of a fucking train. Like what the fuck is going on? It's crazy. Madness, madness. Uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge, complete mistake. It's a misstep. Uh, she's not particularly great in the movie, but the reason why she's not great is because she just doesn't fit in with the world. They never really seemed like they could settle in on like what they wanted her character to be. So she's kind of, she's kind of all over the place, and like the chemistry between her and Harrison Ford is like non-existent, and it needs to be there. Um, and then they have like the new like short round uh, equivalent, which is he's just there to be there. He's just there to check off a box. Like he's just, he, it's honestly, it's like too much. There's like too many, too many characters in that regard. And none of them are developed very well. Uh, the mystery itself ends up being really stupid. The way the villains act is very contrived. The way that they're following Indy and uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge are very contrived. Uh, lots of, lots of things just happen to so the plot. Can, can go on, can continue. And that was uh, that was disappointing. I was I guess it was expected, but I like I said before, it does it feels like a victim of just post-production tinkering and trying to figure out how to make it work with what they had and then going back and doing reshoots and stuff. And uh, it really feels apparent. It just feels like a mess. It kind of feels like like most of the things that Disney's done in the past, you know, almost 10 years. Well, like five or six years, maybe more so, where it's just everything feels off and weird and and tinkered to, to death, and they don't have it has there's no vision, there's no direction, and that's probably the biggest shame of the movie is that it has no voice. It just feels like Indiana Jones product, and like I said, it's a bummer because it's actually it wastes a pretty good Harrison Ford performance in a world in which. We'll probably never get a good Harrison Ford performance again. It's too bad. Uh, Mad, Mads Mikkelsen, uh, who's one of my favorite actors. I've loved him um, even back when in his days is like when he was more just in German movies. He's always been really great. He's great here. He does not give him very much to do. 
but with what he has to do, uh, what he has to use, he, he makes the best of it. I wish he just had, I just wish, <laughs> I wish he had more to do. I wish he had the opportunity to be like, feel like more like a villain. It's so crazy. Cause you can think back to like Raiders. I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark or most of it like a few days ago, just kind of anticipation of this coming out. And that movie is so well tuned, so well paced, so well put together, so well cast. Like, and there's a, there's a pretty diverse set of characters in that too, right? There's a lot of characters, but I never feel like I don't understand them. Like, they're all so finely etched, you know? I understand all of their motivations and their wants and their desires and etc. Or they're cast so well that the casting itself does the storytelling for me. And kind of, I just like can accept this person in that role. Like, this movie doesn't have that. It's, it's very strange. It's a very strange movie in that respect. Like, I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it, man. Like, you know, and it's going to be one of the, it's one of the most expensive movies ever made because especially because of all the reshoots. I'm sure that de-aging, that awful, ugly de-aging, I'm sure that costs a pretty penny. It's probably, it's probably like a third of the fucking budget. And it's such a waste. They should have never have done this. They should have never have made Crystal Skull. If they wanted to continue Indiana Jones like after, like post Last Crusade, they should have waited a little while. And then, you know, they kind of did this with uh, the young, the, the adventures of young Indiana Jones. They kind of did this where they recast Indiana Jones and they he had further adventures uh, when he was young. They should have done that. They should have treated this like James Bond and like every three or four movies recast Indy. That's what they should do. And honestly, that would make a lot of sense because, you know, the, the birth of Indiana Jones as a character is directly from Spielberg wanting to do a James Bond movie and George Lucas being like, well, hold on a second, mate. What if we make our own, like, world-traveling, world-globe-trotting adventure character and we base it on these, like, serials that we loved when we were kids? Kind of like what I did with Star Wars um, with Flash Gordon. Except we'll take it from the old, uh, the old Rock'em Sock'em <laughs> serials. We're all going to Morocco, bitch. Yeah, I don't know. That didn't really make any sense. But, but yeah, um, you know, I guess it's not, not shocking that it's not a great movie. It's not, not exactly a huge surprise, but I don't know. I had my, I just wanted to, I just wanted it to be, at the very least, I was hoping it would be like passively entertaining instead of kind of just aggravating. You know, and it's like, I don't even have, uh, I mean, I say aggravating, but I don't even have like that strong of an opinion about it. It's kind of weird. It's just kind of sitting there in my mind and slowly it's already leaving. Like it's already disappearing. It just kind of leaves no impact. Like the, the action and the set pieces are not, it's just not paced very well. It doesn't have any energy. You know, if you go back and watch the other Indiana Jones movies, at least especially the, mainly the first, the trilogy. Like they have a, they have this, uh, this really fun kinetic pace to them and they're, and the set pieces are fun and uh, dynamic and not so much here. And a lot of that has to do with definitely because it's just all mostly CGI shit. There's a lot of car chase type things in this, a lot of chases in this and, uh, none of them are particularly interesting. Yeah. It's kind of a bummer. All right. Well, I'm home. I'm back. I was I had to take a ride getting groceries. That's my review of Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Goodbye.